Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. This is Dr. Randy Lane Bunch. My son, Cameron, is with me once again. Cameron, you have an interesting background uh, there. That's not your typical home background. Where are you at? No, no, no. This is just a new addition to the house. Um, we <laughs> live in a like small one-bedroom apartment, but we just Pretty really awesome. decided to push out the uh, the walls. That's nice. Now, uh, of you. Yeah, I am... Uh, I am at my uh, wife's work. She is a teacher and we are going to a musical tonight. So I'm actually here with her and going to be joining her for that uh, musical play after this. We both married teachers. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, praise the Lord. Well, we're, we're tonight we're going to begin what's going to probably, Cameron, at least I would say be a, a two-part discussion uh, on the relevance of the miraculous in our modern times. I think it's going to be a good discussion. We're going to hit a lot of different angles on this. We we were talking about this, you and I, and we kind of thought we had one narrative, one line that we were going to follow. And then we thought it might be good to back up and give a little bit more of a historical perspective and then go into the uh, application of these things in our modern era. And we're going to even be discussing some challenges to the scripture, uh, the canon itself in Mark chapter 16. We're going to be addressing a little bit of that either today or next week. So Today, we're not going to go real long, everybody. We're going to go probably 35, 40 minutes. Uh, Cameron's got an event, and so I've got some things coming up, too. But next week, we're going to come back and finish this out. So if you're intrigued by our discussion today, and we're going to touch on a lot of different things, as we said, relevant to the uh, miraculous, I think you're going to be blessed by this little mini-series, I guess you could say. And who knows, could go beyond that. But I think at least two sessions we'll probably touch on. And I, I want to go ahead and read, um, just to have a scriptural basis for this camera. I want to go ahead and read the text that we were talking about out of uh, Mark's gospel, chapter 16, beginning with verse 15. I'm just going to read through verse 20. Very familiar to most of us, I'm sure. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will, not, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. And that's how the Gospel of Mark concludes in most of our uh, translations. There are some translations that have that portion bracketed because in some of the older codices, too particularly, I don't remember their names right now, I didn't go into that much detail, but um, the Alexandrian one is one, but those, those verses from Mark uh, 16, 9 through 20 are not found. They were found in the Textus Receptus, and then some of the other, I think they're like in 188 different codices or something like that, but they weren't in a couple of the more ancient ones, so a lot of people believe that maybe they were added later by a scribe or by some well-meaning person who thought, you know, that I guess verse eight didn't end well. And, and we're not, we're going to reserve judgment on that right now. And we'll, we'll share our opinions and thoughts on that later, but I just want to put that out there as a teaser for people to either, you know, stick with us or join us next week, depending on when we get to this stuff. But the idea that we want to talk about is the relevance of the miraculous. You and I, Cameron, you were raised in the church that of course I pastored. And so you're familiar with seeing the supernatural power of God in operation in, in your own life. Uh, you've seen that, prayed with many people to be filled with the Spirit. You've seen the miraculous take place in your own life and ministry, as have I. And it's interesting to me, and I'm sure to many of us who hold that position that God is still in business, that he's not, you know, older and it's harder for him to do the things he used to do. <laughs> we still believe he's the same God today. You know, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, God said in Malachi, uh, because I changed not, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. We know that he's not only immutable, unchangeable, but he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. And it seems ridiculous almost, really. I hate to use that word because I don't mean to be belittling and saying it, but it seems unfathomable to me that there are people that still hold to this idea that God does not work the miraculous among his people today. And I'm sure you've ran into friends of yours uh, of various theological persuasions. Maybe they still hold that position. Yeah, I uh it wasn't actually till I was in college that I met what uh, are called like cessationalists, where they believe that all the gifts have ceased, that all miracles, signs, wonders, anything supernatural has ceased. And I, I honestly thought it was a joke when I was talking to the person. I thought they really were just messing with me when they said that they didn't believe that God heals anymore. 
And uh, pretty much their belief was that kind of, well, the initial disciples and apostles kind of needed a boost. They didn't have like enough like presence and everything. So they needed signs and miracles to be affirm what Jesus was saying. And then after it kind of gotten out, like it was fine. Jesus was like, now nah, we're going to stop this. God's like, we're all done. It's ended. But that honestly, if you think about it, that logic doesn't hold up because one of the people who were with Jesus witnessed it got to see his death, burial, and resurrection that had like one-on-one -on -one teaching from Jesus how to minister to others, they would need it the least. It would be the people that came after them that didn't get to be eyewitnesses to the account. They got to witness the miracles that happened after. It was that they had, and I mean, we see in the Bible that miracles and signs are for non-believers. It's not for believers, but to witness to non-believers to give evidence of the gospel. So that idea of cessationist that it has ceased to happen is kind of like you said, it just doesn't follow logically. Yeah, it's a logical fallacy. And well, I mean, let me just say this too, I think for the people at home, one of the words that we read out of there uh, a couple of different times, I mentioned the word signs. And whenever we talk about the miraculous, you brought up a good point about the, the signs, the miraculous in that context being for the lost. Now we all hold, you and I hold and people of our ilk, theologically hold that God is a God of the supernatural among his church and among believers as well. Yeah. But the purpose of signs specifically are to confirm the gospel as Jesus implied to the unbeliever. Yeah. Um, I remember reading years ago out of the New American Standard, the word signs, I looked in the margin and it said, attesting miracles. And that's when I kind of codified my definition of signs. They're not just miracles, they're miracles with a mission. They're attesting miracles that accompany the preaching of the gospel to validate the message and sometimes the messenger, because it's not enough for people to believe what you're saying. They also need to have some confidence in you that you're sent of God. And, you know, there were times where God validated various ministers and ministries throughout the scripture and still today by working through them to show that indeed, in fact, Jesus even said, look, if you don't, if you don't believe me for the, from what I'm, for what I'm saying, believe at least for the work's sake, even Jesus ministry was validated by the supernatural. And we're going to get into some scriptures where the Bible explicitly says that. And I think another problem, Cameron, is there's this, this, these thoughts still go around. Well, you know, Jesus did the miracles he did, you know, to validate his divinity and, or his deity. And then of course the apostles, Jesus zapped them with that, you know, apostolic power. So they had, you know, like almost like superheroes or something, you know, they had this power but then when the last of the apostles died, which again is a theological fallacy because God is still raising up the, those sent ones. That's what the word apostolos means. We call them missionaries today, but we talk about Paul's three missionary journeys. So there's still people that are sent ones today. And there were plenty of apostles that did not write scripture. So you can't say, well, the apostles were the ones who wrote the scripture. Well, Barnabas didn't. And there were other apostles that were mentioned, Timothy, different ones who did not uh, author scripture. So these offices are still in play today. But there's this thought that the miracles that Jesus did, he did to validate that he was the son of God. And I want to turn this over to you to say, but let me just say this, that um, <clears throat> that's true and that's not true. It's true in that every miracle Jesus did validated that he was sent from God and validated his message and ministry. And he said that on several occasions, not only to the disciples, but even Nicodemus came to him by night and said, we know that you're a teacher sent from God. For no man can do the miracles, really it's the Greek word signs, that you do unless God were with him. Jesus' ministry again and again was validated by the supernatural. But not to prove that he was divine. Because the miracles Jesus did, he did not do by virtue of his divinity or his deity. But he did them by virtue of the fact that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all that were pressed. The devil for God was with him. So the question is, if Jesus is God, which he is, we believe that he's divine. He was divine, is divine, always shall be divine. He was divine while he walked the earth. But if he, why, why did he need to be anointed? Doesn't the second member of the Godhead have every bit as much power as the third or the first? But it comes to this idea that he, that he emptied himself, right? He emptied himself of his divine privileges. As Philippians chapter 2, around verses 5 through 7, talks about the fact, various translations says he emptied himself. In other words, he laid aside certain inherent privileges he had as the son of God that he might identify with us. And so it became necessary for him to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And it was through the Spirit that he did those miracles, right? 
Yeah, I think it's very good that he did as well, because it gave us a model to follow. I mean, when Jesus came down, it was to show that God emptied himself, took on the form of man, and did things the way that the first Adam, because Jesus is the second Adam, he did things the correct way. So he gave us a demonstration to follow, because that's what Adam was originally supposed to be, our leader, our example. He was supposed to be the perfect man that we were to follow after, but his sin caused us all to be broken and sinful. And so when Jesus came, he did everything correctly. And so we're able to follow his example. I mean, and I mean, the Bible even says be imitators of Christ. And so when Jesus came onto the scene and like John the Baptist is like, no, you need to be baptizing me. We see that Jesus is baptized with water. And then after the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove and baptizes him in the Holy Spirit. And we also see that, I mean, we like are baptized in Jesus's blood, but Jesus's blood was poured out for us. And so he demonstrated three different types of baptism there of water, of repentance, and of the Holy Spirit. And it's a model for us to follow. And another point to what you said is if you, a lot of people didn't need Jesus to prove that he was divine. I mean, yes, his miracles attested that, but today we are not looking for Jesus' miracles just to show us he was divine. But as you said, it was attesting miracles to non-believers and to show what he was trying to teach and to bring about. Yeah, indirectly, they did prove his divinity because Jesus said he was divine. Several times he said, I am. Yep. Um, and so in that sense, indirectly, the miracles validated what he said, and he said he was divine. So you could say in an indirect way, uh, the miracles validated his deity, but he didn't do miracles to prove he's God. That's the difference. Yeah. And, and, and besides that, as you were alluding to, Jesus is a model for us. If Jesus did the miracles that he did by virtue of his deity, we could not reproduce them because we're not divine. But Jesus said, the works that I do shall you do also and greater works. Now, people will say, well, the greater works are we get to preach the gospel and see people born again because in the ministry of Jesus, nobody was technically born again. And that's true. But just go back to what he said, the, the works that I do. And you can't get very far into the works of Jesus until you run into miracles, signs, and wonders, things that cannot be explained by any natural agency. They were done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus also, at times, was limited in what he could do. In his own hometown of Nazareth, right? He could do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Now, if that was the divinity or the deity of Jesus, he could have just overridden that and done what he was going to do. But because he was reliant upon the Holy Spirit, they were not creating an atmosphere which was, which was conducive to the operation of the Holy Spirit. This is something that maybe we can get into at a later time about quench not the Spirit. We create the environment that allows the Spirit of God to move or, or really quench us, puts a lid on the operation of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Jesus in his own life at times couldn't do certain things because of the atmosphere that he was handed, you might say, by the crowd. And I think it's a good point. There are two points there that you made real quickly. One of, it was the individuals there, it was their unbelief. And we have a lot of times in America with the society we live in is very scientific, scientific rationalism. And people are like, well, why aren't miracles and supernatural things happening in America? Well, they do, but not on a greater scale because there is there isn't that level of belief. It's very much we're in his hometown pretty much now of it's just unbelief. And the second point is, you said that Jesus could have overrode that, but he chose not to because Jesus put God put self imposed limitations when he came down, because if he hadn't, it wouldn't have been really coming down as man as of emptying himself. And so he would have kind of defeated his whole purpose for coming down. So he self-imposed limitations. And I think it's a great thing for us to be able to see is that one, that doesn't mean everything is up to us. If Jesus is going to do miracles in his hometown, we're not expected that every time we like pray for something that a miracle is going to happen because it's not just our faith, but it's the faith of the other person and the faith that is maybe in that entire room or the people around that's going to affect it. And so we have that understanding. And I mean, also... Uh, a lot of times people talk about ministers failing because they weren't able to help this one person. Well, Jesus had 12 disciples and one of them was Judas. Did Jesus fail? Was he not a good enough minister? Was he not a good enough shepherd? No, he's our model that we follow. And even he wasn't able to save Judas. I mean, so we have this understanding that everything does not fall back on us, that God has given humans freedom of will. They, he's given them choice and the ability to have faith or to reject it. I remember back, uh, just a quick story, when I was in the traveling ministry, Rick Ramsey and I used to have a ministry, we'd do what we call Holy Ghost meetings, and we would 
go from church to church and supernatural is always an operation we would teach on it and again something lester summerall said always comes back to me you only get what you preach when people say well we don't have people healed in my church we don't see the gifts of the spirit operate in my church first question i got for you is what you're preaching because people's faith can only rise to the level of what they know is available to them and that's one of the reasons why paul said i don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts i just taught a three-part series on sunday night about that at our little church here at the house but um I remember when we were in Virginia one time, Rick Ramsey and I, we went to three churches in a row. First church, we had maybe the greatest meeting in the history of our ministry as far as the supernatural power of God in operation, God just touching people's lives, you know, transforming people's lives. Then we went to a second church, nearly as good. I mean, just, you know, again, tremendous move of the Spirit of God. And then we went from there to this little church. I won't mention any city names because I don't want to, you know, be critical, but we couldn't get anything going in that church. People were showing up for the meeting late. You could feel there was this indifference. They certainly weren't invested into this, or almost kind of like we came at an inconvenience to them, you know, and we couldn't get anything going. And, and we prayed and we sought God and God basically got it across to us, kind of what we were talking about with Jesus. Look, there, there are certain environments. Jesus couldn't even get it going. And so if Jesus's ministry could be limited by the environment handed him by a crowd, certainly my ministry dramatically can be limited in fact we left that place you know and and had i not know i mean i'm telling you as good as those first two meetings were had i not known god had called me <laughs> you'd almost begin to wonder did i should i should just be a shoe salesman you know what, what happened here so i want to back up cameron you were, you were mentioning something about rationalism and i think this is a really good point to make about the west in general if you look at the west talk, when we say the west we're talking about you know the, europe and then america that which was infected by rationalism the enlightenment what was that, the 17th century? I'm getting my, is that right? 16th yeah. century. So when you look at the Enlightenment, it was the rise of rationalism. It was actually kind of a, a counterculture revolution against the um, tyranny of the church in some respects, because the church was so, the Catholic church was so dominant. And, and I think, you know, there was some things worthy to rebel against. I mean, there was some, you know, things there that were obviously unscriptural in the way that the church was, you know, dominating the lives of people and that the way, and of course, between, you know, England and uh, some of these nations that, you know, if you weren't Catholic, then you were killed. If you were, you know, if you weren't Protestant, you were killed. So there's a lot of hypocrisy and emptiness people saw in the church in that regard. It would become a shell of itself, if, if you will. So people were looking for some answers elsewhere. So here comes the Enlightenment, which is the rise of rationalism. And, and rationalism really kind of took ascendancy little bit by little bit over theology in some regards right i mean that's kind of where we've wound up where we are today a little bit yeah and i mean it's kind of almost it, it sounds weird to say but it's almost a privilege to have it of uh, the to have the rationalism and the like scientific side of things because it's in a lot of first world countries like you said the, the ones that experienced the like the scientific revolution and all of that and that's like you said the 16th and 17th century around there where all these ideas started coming out and they started pushing against a lot of it's kind of like um just started pushing against a lot of preconceived like constructions and wanted to come at things from a different angle and to deconstruct and rebuild everything but that was something that was very allowed because they were in such a privileged place to be able to have thinkers because you still have a lot of countries today that are third world countries and they don't operate with this mindset. And you see actually a lot of miracles transpire there, but you also see a lot of the issues that were experienced in the Old Testament where they have a lot of different gods that they go to and a lot of different, and I mean, you still have stories and we, you and I both know ministers that we'll see stories and you have in your own ministry overseas, like stories of people still practicing witchcraft or demon possession, which we don't see as prevalent in America because it's just not that environment, but that doesn't mean the enemy's not working. It's just in other subversive ways. And so we kind of have two different like aspects of the world going on, one in the West, which is the scientific rationalism and the one that we kind of face more and more every day. And often while we see this like conflict and uh, you would be able to talk on it better about the how even the Methodist church was facing this split because yeah. they're a uh, worldwide uh, denomination and they were seeing these like contrasting views because it was very much a West versus the like East of old and new thought. Yeah. You know, in fact, you mentioned the, you know, the primitive belief system in the supernatural that we find in many of these 
developing nations and even in Pakistan where we have a, a pretty strong voice you know for years we were doing a couple of years we were doing Skype crusades where we would you know get up early in the morning and do a Skype crusade and they'd project our image from Skype onto a you know bed sheet in some remote village outside of the you know metropolitan area in Pakistan be in some remote village and we had preach for 30 minutes pray for the sick and I mean tumors disappearing cripples being healed I mean we for for two years in two years, we saw 2,000 souls saved and hundreds upon hundreds of miracles, maybe as many miracles as we saw souls saved, or maybe more. And then throughout our life and ministry, we've just had so many testimonies, both, you know, within the United States and abroad, of uh, you know, the miraculous power of God. So when people try to pull that on me today, it's like, you came to me too late. That's like somebody tried to tell someone who just sat down to a T-bone steak that beef doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, this is a part of our not, I don't want to say everyday experience, but a common experience that we have. I get testimonies all the time. Just the last month, you know, our, our audience is about 4.7 million. So, you know, we, we probably have way more testimonies of the miraculous than what we actually hear. But we had just last uh, month, I think it was, we had a woman that was barren for all these many years. She prayed and believed God with us when she saw the broadcast and she has since conceived. Had another guy, tumor disappearing. You know, this is common stuff we get, reports back we get all the time. But as you were saying, there was, in more recent times, many will remember, uh, especially those inside the church, may remember that the Methodist church went through a big split recently. And um, there was the more liberal side that, you know, was not necessarily holding to, you know, the inerrancy of scripture, the supernatural nature of God, they kind of gone liberal. So it was almost more like, a, I don't know, what what is a church once it's abandoned the scriptures? You know, it's, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we want to help people kind of almost like a charitable organization, minus the scriptures. <laughs> and so, you know, they would have held to the scriptures, but they wouldn't have claimed their inerrancy, they wouldn't have believed. It. But then there was an African contingent that helped sway the vote so that when it came, okay, are we going to endorse homosexuality and these alternate lifestyles as legitimate? Those that were from Africa held tenaciously to the scriptures and said, no, marriage is between a man and a woman. And so the vote went toward the conservative view, the biblical view. But there was still a lot of people that held to the more liberal view. Now, why do they? Why is there a liberal view? And so they're going to go start some other kind of denomination now, which is not going to be any denomination at all. It's just going to be a false church. But why? Why do? Why are there people with liberal views that don't believe in, you know, the traditional values that the Scripture upholds? Because once you've left the supernatural behind, what do you really have? It's it's just a philosophy. If you don't believe in the immut Im immutability of God and his counsel and his word and his presence and his power, then all, all bets are off. You can, you can change anything. Once the word is no longer the immutable counsel and truth of God's word, if it's just man-made or if it's something that was relevant for the time, but, you know, things have changed and, you know, we need to get past all that, well, then you can create anything. You can, you know, all bets are off. And I, I think it was... Um, What's the one that wrote the brothers, um, Karim Alkaz, I forget the, uh, the, the author, um, famous author, the Russian author, he was a Christian, but he said, um, once you've, uh, he said something to this fact, once you've left truth behind, um, all, anything's possible, or anything, all bets are off, in other words. In other words, once you've left the immut immutability of scripture, you can just write your own moral code. So with this denial of the supernatural, comes this moving away from God. And you can still call it God, but it's it's a denial of God. And the example I gave you when we were talking about this before was when the uh, people that came out of, of, of Egypt with Moses and Joshua, they had seen the miracle work, working hand of God. So they stayed true to God. But the Bible said, then another generation arose that knew not the mighty works of God, and they basically forsook the Lord. And that's what we're seeing in much of the church today. Yeah. And I mean, when you take away the supernatural from the Bible, or whenever you take out any piece of the Bible and try to just take a part of it, you strip everything from it. The Bible has to exist as an entire document. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, like, I was just talking to someone who is very near and dear to me. And I was talking about how when something is said in the Bible, when something comes across that I don't like, I don't get to change that. I, I have to accept it. And it may not feel great but I have to accept it. And they were like, well, I just don't like it. And it's like, it doesn't matter if you like it. And I'm like there. And one of my favorite things that one of my teachers from uh, the university I went to said, he was like, if you read everything in the Bible and agree with it, you've probably read it wrong. He's like, <laughs> the Bible should be taking you and causing you to reflect and change what, and the idea was that so many people and 
he was looking at it from a historical standpoint too, about how every culture has found their Jesus. And he talked about just simply with race, how many times like did, have we seen the picture of white Jesus with long hair and right. it's a very European Jesus or like uh, black communities made a black Jesus and Korean communities made a Korean Jesus and all these different communities took the aspects of Jesus they saw, made them in their likeness and their image instead exactly. of us conforming to his likeness and his image. And when you strip the Bible of the miracles, when you strip it of all the things that chips away at us and refines us, like you said, it becomes this moralistic document that we can shape and change because as culture moves, so does that ever moving mark of what is moral. Because the societies we live in will choose where morality is all the time. But the fact is, if you want a true morality, you have to go to someone that supersedes yourself. You have to go to someone that supersedes our time, our space, our relative perspective, because otherwise we're just ever shifting that that you, line. You need to have an objective moral law giver to have an objective yeah. moral law is what you're saying. And, you know, it's funny because um, we're, we're talking about this. This is nothing new. Going back to, you know, however far you want to go back, but even going back to the Enlightenment, we were talking about, like, like for example, Voltaire, who was a, a, a French philosopher who I'm sure was brilliant and had a lot of good things to say, but he was very much against the Bible because, again, this idea of, you know, we're progressing past this. And like I said, it's not that some of these guys did not have a legitimate beef against the way the, the, the Catholic Church or the church at that time was stewarding these things. I mean, there, were, there, there was tyranny in the church and, you know, exercise against people. That's why, you know, Jan Hus and all these other reformers were killed because on Tyndale and we could go on down the line. Uh, there were terrible things done in the name of Christ that did not reflect Christ himself. So it wasn't like they, they didn't have a bone to pick, a legitimate bone to pick. But Voltaire, you know, I think his words were, you know, in 100 years, there will, you know, the Bible will be completely forgotten, something that. And, and then, of course, 100 years later, his own home had become a printing press for, I think it was the um, International Bible Society and Bibles were being <laughs> carried around the world. The Bible always rises up to um, outlive its pallbearers, as it's been said. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to me today, the arrogance, if you think about the arrogance of mankind to think that because we progressed down the timeline somewhat and we've learned a few things about the natural world, that we feel we, could, we can displace God, this idea of the God of the gaps, that every time we discover something that we once attributed to God, like the thunder, you know, they used to say, well, that was the gods, they're angry. Well, now we found out it's a natural phenomenon, so there's one less place for God to hide, and this idea that the more we discover about nature and understand its processes, the more we've displaced the need for God. And that's not true at all. All the natural world tells us is how God does what he does. In fact, the Bible is very clear that the, that the heavens declare the glory of God. And all we find when we look at science is the means by which God does things. It doesn't mean we've removed God. Somebody gave a great example one time of two different kinds of explanation. There's, uh, uh, I guess you could say, a methodological explanation and a, an explanation of agency. Like, for example, if somebody says, why is the water boiling? And somebody could say, well, the heat from the burner is exciting the um, molecules in the, uh, you know, uh, kettle of water, causing the kinetic energy to increase. The molecules are moving more fast and, um, you know, causing the water to boil. That's, that's an explanation of methodology. Or you could say, well, because I wanted a cup of tea. That, that, that's an explanation of agency. I did it. And somebody said, no, you didn't do it. We, now we know that it was the heat and the you know, molecules. But yeah, but those are not two competing explanations. They're the same explanation from two different angles. Uh, one just shows how I did it. I, I boiled the water, but now we know how I did it, right? And so a lot of people think, well, we've gotten rid of God because we know how you know, nature works. Well, we've, we've learned a little bit, but there are so many things we don't know, particularly when we go down to the, you know, level of, you know, the, uh, uh, um, what am I trying to say, the subatomic world. Um, there's so many things we don't know. Uh, looking, we've discovered a little bit about DNA, but there's, there's information in the cell that we have never understood yet. How does the cell know to do certain things? So long story short, there's this arrogance we have in our Western materialistic rationalistic society that says well we've uncovered all this stuff when really we don't know that much but we think we've displaced god we've toppled god off the throne with with darwin or something like that which is really just not only a tremendous arrogant hubris but it's just wrong because as you and i both know both loving apologetics as we do 
the more we discover in the world of science, the more it points toward God, not away from God. And I mean, there are many scientists who are not even believers, but believe in what is called intelligent design, that there has to be some type of acting force creating or intending this world because the possibilities and the expansiveness and the complexity just doesn't happen and occur by random. Right. And I mean, I think it's also interesting to note is that since biblical times, there's been improvement upon society. There has been improvement in technology, in science, in art, in uh, all these different areas, but there has been not a single person that has been able to improve upon the morality of the Bible. That's There's right. not a single person that has been able to improve upon what was listed there. And when we live our lives by that, how much better our societies get? I mean, you can take England that was falling apart um, during the time of William Wilberforce when a quarter of women were prostitutes to support a gin addiction. There were right. brothels catering to people that were under 14 years of age. I mean, there was just rampant like decay of society. And what brought it back was the gospel. And there is nothing else that could have done that. You can have brought Confucianism in. You can have brought Islam in. You can have brought all these other world religions in because there is no power in them. There is nothing supernatural. There is nothing miraculous in them. And that's what we're going to have to do a whole broadcast just on 18th century England and talk about the Wesleys and Newton and, and my hero, William Wilberforce, that you mentioned, because you're right. It was an absolute revival of the scriptures between the Wesley brothers and then William Wilberforce and his friends called the Clapham sect. I know this is a bit of history. A lot of people maybe don't know, but it would be wonderful to talk about that because it shows how a very uh, dedicated group of people holding fast to the integrity of the scriptures can turn a whole nation and we you and i are still living in the light of that dramatic change that wilberforce and his friends and the wesley brothers and all these brought i mean that was part of that great shining light because who came over from there was whitfield and brought you know revival to the to the united states of america preparing us for the uh, fight for independence tremendous season in history where like you said it was a revival of morality that brought it back to humanity i mean the church was totally void of any uh authority to speak into spiritual matters at that time they were part of the problem not part of the answer but then god raised up his own people outside of the church of england outside of the institutional church among these methodists you know these these uh on the other side of the tracks ministers if you will who you know did not have the 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 uh, notoriety of the established church but absolutely renovated morally uh their generation that would be great to talk about I know we, we're a little bit limited on time, so I want to kind of bring it back around as we start to close, but it is silly to me, uh, and I, I, I hate to use that word again, I'm not trying to belittle anybody, but it, in the light of what we're saying, it seems untenable <laughs> to think that we have a supernatural God who wants to relate to us and that somehow, you know, he's got one arm tied behind his back and that he just doesn't do the miraculous anymore, and to think that somehow we can frame, have a framework of theology that says, God only works through, you know, non-supernatural means in the sense of the miraculous uh, to accomplish his works today, I think is really arrogant. Because as you said, if Jesus needed the miraculous, if the early church needed the miraculous, how much more today in this hyper-skeptical climate in which we find ourselves, how much more do we need the miraculous? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I can actually understand to a certain degree why a lot of young people, I mean, there's about 30 years that separates my uh, age group from your age group. And I know a lot of the people in my age group that were raised with even somewhat biblical values or whatnot still have questions about the supernatural because, as you said, if it's not preached in your church, you're not going to see it. If And then you have so many churches that didn't give answers to people. And so I understand, like, the side of it that does end up being like my age that is like more skeptical because they never got to see a real demonstration or a real leadership from it. But thankfully I was raised in a church by like you that did witness those things. And so for me and for any believer that's had any interaction, like real sincere interaction with God to not believe in that supernatural, like you said, is silly because, and I think a lot of people talk themselves out of it. Because you you witness something supernatural, and then like after a while, and life is hard because life is hard. Life sucks sometimes. 
And that's part of it is, but with, as believers, we know that we have something greater waiting. We have God to take us through these storms and these trials that he will give us joy. But yeah, life sometimes sucks. And instead of leaning into God and trusting him and diving into our word and praying and reaching out to him, we go, well, you know what? Maybe that experience I had with God, maybe it just, I was, I just made up some stuff to it. I just, I justified it in my head. And we start talking ourselves out of this experience and this interaction we've had with God. And we, in a sense, belittle God yeah. to make ourselves feel better about our circumstance. The, the problem of suffering. I, I can see this, this is opening up so many different channels of discussion. You know, the problem of suffering, the number one uh, argument people have against the existence of God. If God is a supernatural all-knowing being, why doesn't he intervene? Why doesn't he stop all suffering? And there, there are some really good answers to that that we could get into. Of course, we won't today. But what we're going to kind of stop here, but I want to give people kind of a preview of coming events next week. We're going to go back to Mark 16, and we're going to talk about some of the challenges that that passage of scripture from Mark 16, 9 through 20 has historically. But we're also going to demonstrate that you don't have to have those particular verses to believe in signs, wonders, and miracles. They affirm what other scriptures say, but everything that is in Mark 16, 9 through 20 is validated through many other portions of scripture. And then, of course, through our ongoing experience today. You know, uh, you talk about scientific proofs. One of the scientific proofs is what is our ongoing routine experience with life and nature? I mean, what do we still see happening? Well, if God is a God of the miraculous, we should expect him to see, do miracles today. If he's not, we shouldn't be seeing any today. So are we seeing some miracles? So we'll probably share some, uh, maybe even out of our book. I have a bunch that I put in our book, The Gospel Saving Power, from our ministry years ago in India that are just tremendous. But we'll talk about all of that uh, next week when we come back and I don't know that we'll wrap this up really. I don't know if we're ever going to wrap up any of these discussions because they're so rich. As you're talking, as I'm talking, I'm thinking, man, we, we need to talk about this. We need to talk about that. So I'm sure we'll be talking about apologetics down the road. We'll be talking a little bit about history, church history. And like, like I said, the Wilberforce era there in, in England, one, one of my favorite books ever. If you haven't read Eric Metaxas' book, I want to just close with a couple of things. I want to share uh, the name of a book, and I'm going to ask you to do the same because there's one that you read that was really good. But the one I want to share with everybody if you haven't had a chance to read 2,000 Years of Charismatic Church History, that may not exactly be the title, but if you look up something like that, 2,000 Years of Charismatic Church History by, I think it's Eddie Hyatt is the author. It's a wonderful book and shows how the supernatural from the days of Jesus on through our present day have never diminished, have never gone away. There's always been a hungry group of people somewhere that believed in the apostolic move of God, the apostolic power that we saw in the book of Acts, continuing through the church and experienced it. But then, Cameron, you read something about the miracles of Jesus, another look at the miracles. What, what was yeah, that? it was uh, Fresh Eyes on uh, Jesus's Miracles, and it's written by Doug Newton. And the reason I liked it is because there are so many ways to approach the Bible and to read the Bible. And sometimes you really just need a fresh perspective on it. Yeah. And not only does he demonstrate how to help people do that, but he gives you a fresh perspective on the miracles of Jesus. And not only does he obviously believe in them, but it shows a lot of intention behind why he did them. And the, not just, just cause it was, there were reasons. And that one of my favorite points that uh, as a little teaser, he explains why Jesus crossed the sea to go and cast a demon out of a demoniac. And it's interesting because he had put a perspective of that. Jesus literally went over there and then went to a different place. So he literally went across the sea to visit that one man and then left. And I thought that was just a cool point that Jesus will literally go across the sea to disrupt a demonic force and then continue on. But there's a lot more to it, but it's just, it's a good book to really get your brain going, start thinking about the miracles of Jesus and thinking about it in a new way you might not have. What a great note to finish on though, that God will cross an ocean just to meet your need. I love that. Why don't we uh, close with a word of prayer, Cameron, and pray for the people. And maybe you need a miracle in your life today. Maybe you have a financial situation, a marital situation, a physical situation in your body. You know, you may be facing odds right now. You just don't know how you're going to overcome. Well, you're not going to do it alone. You can do it with heaven's help, though. So the Bible said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Greek word sozo, saved, delivered, healed. It all, it means all of that. So I'm going to pray for you, Cameron. And I, we're going to pray for you right now. We're going to believe God with you for a miracle, a healing, a provision. We've seen it all over the years. We've seen God move in all these different ways. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we stand in faith with those watching the broadcast tonight. We thank you that you're still the same miracle working God. And best of all, 
you're still moved with compassion. You're a God of power toward us because you're a God of love for us. And we pray, Father God, that you would demonstrate your love right now and heal the people, provide for the people, minister peace to the people, bring solace and consolation to that troubled marriage, still that troubled sea. Father, we ask you to move mightily on behalf of those watching today for that one crying out for a miracle. Lord, don't pass me by like a blind Bartimaeus saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Lord, we ask you to stop as you did on that day and call them forth to bring that miracle in their life. We thank you for it. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And friend, if you don't know Jesus, just call on his name. The Bible said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't have to pray a fancy prayer. It doesn't have to have the right words in it. If you just say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, save me. I can't save myself. That's enough. And uh, God will reach out and touch you. And if, you, if, if that happens, please message us. We would love to hear. And if you've just been blessed by the broadcast, you've been blessed by our discussion. We're going to be doing this week in, week out. So we would love to hear from you. So private message us or even just make a comment below. We would love to get your feedback. So Cameron, any closing words, anything uh, that you have yet to say or? No, I'm good. All right. Well, guys, we thank you so much for joining us. We're going to finish this discussion or at least continue it uh, next week, same time. So join us at six o'clock next Wednesday night right here for Connections. By the way, we did name the broadcast. We had one of our partners say, how about Connection or something like that? And I thought, that's right. We're going to call it Connections because we're connecting with you and we're connecting with God through his word. So join us for Connections again next week as we start about, uh, we talk part two about this, about the miraculous and the relevance of the miraculous in our day. All right, God bless you guys. Talk to you later, Cameron. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.